it's a tough one. It's sort of threading the needle of multiple objectives. Uh, Greg talked about geopolitics, uh, trade dynamics, et cetera. So we're thinking about an increasingly complicated geopolitical world. That's all I'll, I'll say. Uh, we're also looking at uh, falling cost of technology, but also rising cost of climate change. We're thinking about access uh, to clean energy to all uh, consumers. How on earth do we achieve all of these objectives at the same time? What are some of the solutions that you all think about? What are you more excited about? Because frankly, it's, it's daunting. Uh, go, talking about Marina's point, going from 20% to 85% is an enormous lift. So how do we get there? What are some of the areas that you find most promising to achieve that? Lisa, yeah, so I can that? start. Um, so I would just say I think one of the challenges with the energy transition is getting the timing right. Because I think we've, you know, we've kind of, you know, kind of rushed ahead and 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 then had issues with uh, with supply chains. I mean, the wind turbine, you know, OEM industry example. is a good yeah. example of, you know, the race to build uh, bigger turbines has resulted in, you know, component uh, quality issues, and the industry is still grappling, you know, with those issues today. So I think, how do we get the timing right in an environment where we're going to have this massive uptick in demand between now and the end of the decade, you know, driven really by data centers? But then probably in the beginning of the next decade, we actually see AI kind of kicking in as a real you know, force to, to reduce energy um, use and enhance energy efficiency. So getting that timing right, I think, is going to be challenging. Yeah, I would say I, th I think it's going to be a mix of a lot of things. You know, the, the, uh, if, if I just think about the energy transition in the context of the power grid, um, you know, it's, it's a very complicated beast with lots of different sources of generation and lots of different um, you know, end pieces of demand. And I think. The solutions are going to be a whole bunch of things. There, there is no silver bullet. You know, it will be renewables. There will be gas that will be part of the transition. Um, you know, there, there will be nuclear. You know, we're starting to see that pop up. So I Absolutely. think on the generation side, it's a lot of things. And then I think there's going to be an interesting layer of just making everything more dynamic, you know, both on the supply side and the demand side that really helps balance everything. And so You've already seen it starting to happen with in, in some kind of basic ways, I'll call it, as renewables have gotten to the grid, where obviously renewables are more volatile, and um, you know the grid gets spiky with you know late evening, uh, you know early evening kind of AC demand and all those things, and so you need to match that supply demand, um, and so the generation stack just becomes a lot more complicated. We see a whole bunch of emerging things around making the demand and supply side more dynamic, and so. Um, you know, if you get a whole bunch of electric vehicles out there in the grid and people are plugging in at different times of the day, they're pulling demand, but there's actually small windows of time where maybe their batteries can put back into the grid and, you know, um, support short spikes. Um, we've been seeing more recently things like Bitcoin mines getting paid to shut down in periods of time when the grid needs power and saying, I'll actually give this power back to the grid for 15 minutes, and they get paid multiples of what they would make mining Bitcoin. And there's just a ton of examples of that, but it's really just everything more dynamic so you can meet the needs in real time that I think um, adding a bunch of smarts, smarts and connectivity on the supply and demand side really will play a, a really interesting role in that. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really excellent point. And data, I know we're going to get to data and AI is going to play an enormous part in un understanding where we can make those dynamic changes, or where those like, elements of dynamism can emerge because we need to plan you know, better for how the grid is going to need to expand or how technologies and power generation are going to need to be kind of repositioned to support the new economy that's growing both out of the uh, energy transition technologies that we're seeing and just, you know, the progression of the, t of the global economy on its normal path. Well, current path, normal path might be wrong. But I think that the thing that's daunting about it um, as, as well as exciting is the breadth, the breadth of the opportunity set. You know, you, there are so many different ways you can play into the theme kind of depending upon your um, kind of appetite. I think the, the other piece to, to keep in mind is that unlike other areas of technological innovation where disruption tends to be the focus, um, there's a lot of the energy transition where we don't want to disrupt things. Um, people are using power all the time right now, and we want to make sure that it's as, as undisruptive as possible for everyday people so that they can carry on with their lives in the face of this enormous kind of structural change. So I think that the low-hanging fruit kind of near-term technologies will need to consistently take that in, into account. Um, obviously, industrial decarbonization kind of takes it out of the hands of um, or out of the kind of general remit of, um, of the general populace. But if you're thinking about power demand, if you're thinking about, you know, how does how do we continue to um, fund all of these new tech or 
power all these new technologies whilst also making sure that when someone goes to turn on a light, it turns on and it's not ruinously expensive. I think that balance needs to continuously be struck and that kind of managing to comfort or managing to what everyone's you know, established comfort level of power availability is, is, is really important, which is where I think a lot of these dynamic strategies and data are gonna be really kind of vital for us to know, you know, know at the front end what we can and can't do. Uh, and then enable the technologies that we are kind of building and, and funding to work towards that kind of end goal and, and to keep the, uh, the system still moving um, without too much disruption. Agreed. Marine, anything else? I mean, I would focus on a couple of things. One is intermittency and one is distribution, right? So obviously on the, the intermittency side, because it's not always windy, it's not always sunny, they're free, but they're not working all the time. I think battery storage is one area we focus on yes. quite a bit. It really is going to enable the uh, kind of ability to have renewable power available 24-7. So that's one side of it. And then on the, the distribution side, it's very much grid capacity, kind of critical. Um, so there's... You know, and then decentralizing. It's you know hard to kind of decarbonize parts of the economy uh, that are remote. You know, demand centers, and so the decentralization of energy uh, delivery um, also very important to invest in. The other thing I would talk about is um, sort of the supply versus demand sides, and this is where we go yes. back to kind of Schroeder's is a very large asset manager that does engage with the companies that we hold. So on one hand, we're trying to engage with the demand side and kind of in encourage that corporate decarbonization. And the more that the market um, rewards companies for becoming less emissions intensive, again, like the across the economy companies, not the suppliers, the less we're just kind of beating up the suppliers of conventional energy and saying, you should sort of take it on the chin and stop producing, even though your customers still want what you have. So that's, that's a challenging discussion. Um, but again, we're kind of doing that on the demand side. And then on, on the supply side, we, you know, we do, we have an engagement program with a thousand, you know, companies that we hold um, through the next, you know, number of years. And all of our PMs and analysts, 170 people are really actively engaged in that, um, you know, in that process of engaging with those companies and working through kind of where their future capex is going and again, how they're making those, those changes. And they are focused on, again, sort of grid, grid building and, and battery and uh, green hydrogen and all the things I'm sure we'll touch on in this panel. So those are some of the key areas. 